Bracket racing isn't just what we do, it's who we are. It's how we identify ourselves. What does bracket racing mean to me? It's my life. It's where my people are. My idols, my family, my friends. Bracket racing is life. Bracket life. Hello and welcome back to the Bracket Life broadcast, episode 37 with Brandon and as always, Andrew Stark. Andrew, how is it going tonight? We're doing all right. We're racking up some numbers pretty fast with all these back-to-back-to-back weeks, aren't we? We are. We are. Yeah. We're pounding them all in there. Uh, <laughs> something I thought about just as we were <clears throat> doing the commercial, getting all fired up and everything like that. Yep. Uh, this will be our last episode before we go racing. Oh, good point. Yeah. I'm glad with this. Yeah. That's this right. Is, That's pretty exciting. That is actually. That is. That, you know, I'm that right does get that. me rolling a little bit. I have to admit, it was a little bit rough getting rolling tonight just because everything <clears throat> that was going yeah, on life, last week and a half. Life. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah. No, that's how it goes. That's how it goes. Uh, we'll get fired up. Our sponsor for tonight's episode, Luskville Dragway. Uh, Arnie posted it up today. Flyer on Facebook. A little hard to read. So if Arnie is watching, little, we, we got to work on the, the uh, payout and the entry fee numbers there. But um, <clears throat> Precision Concrete finishing opening weekend, Malcolm Carpentry opening weekend, whatever you want to call it. Bunch of sponsors. Everybody participating in it. Uh, Saturday, five grand to win Super Pro, 2,500 to win Sunday. And I believe that's 250 for the weekend driver. I that. saw the five grand and the 25. They were the first two things that jumped out at me. Yeah, so that's all that really I did, matters. I did see that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, all, that's all that you know, matters to us. Uh, Semi pro also a thousand dollars to win each day. Junior dragsters will be there as well. Check it out. I'll be there. I'm excited. I'm excited to get there and see everybody. Yeah. Hang out again. Back. Get back in the car. Do all that other stuff. You know. That's gonna be a good it just, time. It kicks it off, man. Yeah. yeah Starts today. Kind of snuck up. I got to be honest with you. Like I've been scrambling the last few weeks to get ready to go, and and I saw the post for Arnie, and I, I've seen some of the other ones for the tracks out this way, and a few other events like just the local stuff, and I'm like, hmm, all right. And it's right here on the doorstep. So this is fun. Long winter yeah. is almost over. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like looking at it because then, like you said, you know, it's just it just gets me wound up. Yeah. You know, May is awesome. I'm excited. You know, yes. if, it, if it does like hold off on the rain, it, it has been a little crazy. Yeah, in the like a few weeks. <clears throat> there's an optimistic side to this conversation that we, you know, have glossed yeah. over on the other side, but uh, I'll roll with that. I, I really, really need that. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so everybody that's watching, I know we got uh, some guys on there: Chuck Fram, Mike Hickey, Mike Doe, Mobile Life, RV Center, uh, Racing. Always here. Yep. Always paying attention. Love it. Harry Olson. He's still trying to get ready. Harry, you got two weeks, but less than two weeks. Uh, we'll see you there. Eight uh, business days. Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, five and three. Yeah, that's that's, that's a quick eight. <laughs> Um, just in case anybody was keeping track, Canadian countdown will dive into a, another awesome weekend. Yeah, for Canadian racers, really cool. Uh, for everybody that was paying attention, bunch of posts on there. Yep. Almost, we were very close to backing up the 50k win with a 100k win. Jamie Tupper down to the semifinal finish, 100k TV promotions race at Beach Bend in Kentucky. Jamie's always had great success at Beach Bend. Yep. Um, Loves going there. I've been to a bunch of events. The TV race looked awesome. Yeah. Yeah. They fought yeah. weather a lot, but looked really good. Like they had that's a big car count. Like they were rolling with yeah. uh and, and quality stuff. Like just a ton of hitters from all over the place. I mean, it was a real yeah. who's who race with uh quite a few Canadians that made it down there too, right? Yes. Like uh, a few people hitting off first time heading south and a few hitting off the first southern race of the the, the year. But yes, real yes. who's who event. It was fun. Yes, the uh, the 128 car shootout for 100 grand to win was you know was wicked. Didn't Just, disappoint, right? No, like it, not it one filled the advertisement. It. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Other Canadians who were down there uh, went to Bowling Green. Brock Godmare, the Flying Frog, Jamie Bridge, Laura Shepard, obviously with uh, with Jamie and uh, Richard Arnold was down there, made an appearance. You know, had some fun, shook down some stuff, learned a lot. I know that's you know. Those events are tough, right? They're different. They're tough to just jump into. Oh, yeah. But really are the 
you know, between that weekend and Galat, you know, really are two events that are ideal ones that I would love to go to for yeah. the style of racing that I like to do. Because it's still 350 to 400 cars. It's still a lot, but not, it's not 600. Yeah, there's a, it, it's on the top end of that tipping point, right? Yeah. Where it goes yeah. to just being a little bit epically long, but at the same time, it's uh, they were like those are fun type events and mm-hmm. great tracks. Like I've never been to either one of them, but like everyone you talk to, are, you know, those are iconic places to go, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, they certainly live up to the uh, the billing. So great job by Jamie. That was uh, exciting. I uh, I tried desperately to stay up and watch that. Like I was out thrashing in the shop all that uh, Saturday. I hit eight cars. Jamie's going around to the semis and I'm like, I'm going to make it. And then around 5 a.m. I woke up and I'm like, got to figure out what happened. I don't know what happened. Yeah. 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 I'm lost now. Right. Yeah. You still plan on who knows what, but that uh, was great to go back and see that they had a great, uh, great run. So mm-hmm. good job to them. Um, we'll roll on here. So at the same time this last weekend, um, NHRA had, this was kind of neat. So I, I threw this on here because it, and, you know, it's unfortunate that we didn't have a win in this one, but it was kind of a neat setup. So NHRA had a, a regional top alcohol event. Um, if you follow YouTube stuff, Cletus McFarland, right? Um, pretty well known, I imagine. Uh, if you don't, then go check it out. A lot of drag racing content is kind of fun. It's a different deal, right? So they host an event called Cletus and Cars, and NHRA tacked on uh, like a regional event. So Top Alcohol Drakes or Top Alcohol Funny Car, the only two classes outside of whatever they ran. Jeff Chatterson uh, made his way down from, uh, I believe Jeff's in like Western Ontario. I always kind of forget where Jeff's from, but kind of my neck of the woods. Uh, he squeezed into the eight-car field. I think they had about 15 cars there. Uh, made the bump with 11 uh, uh, thousands to spare. Uh, unfortunately, ran into Tony Stewart, like the Tony Stewart. Um, yeah. Very national event winner and now NHRA divisional winner because unfortunately, he took Jeff out en route to a W for the regional event. Um but the side note that I want to take from that because it's kind of cool to see Canadians featured. So if you watch Cletus's videos, there was one they did from Indy that featured Jeff. Yeah. They had a match race between uh, Jeff's injected nitro dragster and the um, you know famous mullet El Camino that uh, Cletus runs. And uh, uh, Jeff um, gave him the hit. The car is out like 60 plus feet before Jeff. Yeah. And I think Jeff caught him like 200 feet out. Like if you ever want a comparison of fast, it was really cool to see this, you know, mid six second pro street style, like, you know, drag and drive car get past after getting the hit and a full 60 feet at like 200 feet out. And Jeff went 540, which was like yeah. tuned down past, right? Yeah. So I um, want to give credit where credit's due. That was kind of fun to see them featured. It's nice to see some Canadian content on there, right? Because it's you know, neat, right? It is, right? Uh, rolling with the Canadian content, Nitro Chaos. There's a bit of a theme in all this, right? This was maybe Nitro Weekend. So it's yep. a, a touring Nitro series. They were down at Edgewater Motorsports Park, which we'll talk about in a little bit here because I made a post to those who follow me on a little bit on Facebook. Um, they've got a neat bar section at their track. They were advertising it open for this event and some neat add-ons to their facility. But uh, they were running Nitro Chaos. Um, I got to give credit where credit's due here. Michael Beard sent me this info. This was not me doing research. This was flat out Michael sending me a post saying, look, Canadians winning stuff. And uh, Todd Bruce of Manitoba makes the trek. And I can't fathom how long a drive that would have been from Manitoba to Edgewater. But 20 cars showed up. It's an eight-car field for the A-Main. It features like NHRA, former NHRA top alcohol champion Megan Myers, NHRA Nostalgia Top Fuel Champion, Tyler Hilton, and uh, former IHRA standout Mitch King. I don't know if you remember Mitch from the old IHRA days. He had a fleet of Nitro cars. Uh, Todd j- bumps into the field. I think he got in at number four in the eight-car field. Um, gets down to the final to race Tyler Hilton and wins. So we've got a big Nitro win on that tour. And that's a kind of a neat deal because it's anything that runs on Nitro, basically. Like... You've got injected nitro cars to nostalgia NHRA top fuels to I'm going to guess Mitch there was with you with a nitro funny car or a nitro altered because that's pretty much what he campaigns, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so great job for uh, the team from Manitoba. It was not a name that I was all that familiar with, but uh, it was great to see them pick up the W uh, on that end of it. Um, and that kind of wraps things up because our episode in between, we uh, hit on a few different uh, other people, obviously Matt with the win and, um, there was a few other Canadians out rolling, like they had a Great Lake Stock Super Stock event in mid Michigan. Quite a few of the Super Stock contingent uh, made their way out there. 
Others went to Atco for a national open out there. Um, unfortunately, I think rain killed all those events. I tried to find results, but it doesn't look like anyone got anything finished. But a uh, lot of Canadians on the road this past weekend. So that's pretty much the countdown for this episode because everyone's gearing up to go racing up here, I think. Exactly. Exactly. Like we said, it's coming up. Uh, season opening bracket races, TMP, uh, Grand Bend Motorplex, Oswald Dragway, obviously, uh, you know. Victoria Day weekend. It's yeah. coming. Yeah. It's coming. National We're Open excited. at the uh, Cayuga at TMP. So it's um, it'd be a fairly big weekend for there, right? And then 5K to win in Luskville. Yeah. 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 It's good. So you kind of talked a little bit about it when you started talking about Edgewater. Yep. Um, I labeled this kind of racetrack attractions. I'm not really sure if that's the right word for it, but it sounds, sounds all right. It's catchy. Um, so Edgewater... I'll let you explain it, but Edgewater posted a video today of a new section, I guess, for fans, racers, whoever, spectators to go. Yeah. So, you know. So they, I, I thought it was neat. So I, I was so surfing around and I, I saw this because, uh, again, I was looking for results, just see what's going on in the world. And they've opened up the racetrack sidebar. So it's like eighth mile mark. It's a building. I'm assuming it's a building that they didn't probably build, but it was maybe a former tower, but they renovated it. So it's like a track sidebar indoor air conditioning there's tv setup i mean it's your basic sports bar type setup beside the racetrack with a gondola style like viewing area so you can go outside and watch the race um you know beer on tap there's coolers there's food now they sell like food out of the food trucks beside it but i mean they had like seven different food trucks advertised that you know grab your food come up yeah and i'm thinking to myself as i'm looking at this i'm like this this is the type of stuff that you're used to seeing at like, you know, major junior type sports events. All right. Like I don't want to sell this to like NHL stadium because I know that's, that's a different type of, you know, yep. uh, level, but like, this is the type of stuff you see when you watch, you know, major type sports is areas where you can go get beers. You're not baking out in the sun all day. You know, if it rains, there's somewhere to go. Like, I mean, even the Sky Dome has a retractable roof. The thing was built in the 90s, early 90s, but even has the ability to stop it from raining on you in an event. And in drag racing, I find we haven't done as much in general for, you know, the creature comforts, right? That a lot of other um, major type sports events, like not the major ones that we're used to in the sense of the top four or five leagues, but like the, you know, uh, development leagues. And this was one of those things where I'm like, that's awesome. Like, that's the type of thing I think we need to see more of. So it kind of spawned a small discussion we had on the side of like, you know, other things you'd like to see other attractions that, you know, I think would help at racetracks outside of just the, you know, splintery wooden seats and stands that, you know, are 97,000 degrees when you sit down in them. Right. Um, I don't want to say it's a little archaic, but it's a different changing time. The demographic of people, the type of spectators we're looking to draw are different, even if they still love cars and racing. Um, when you can go to a major junior sports game and sit in a custom seat at a bar for, you know, a $50 ticket and watch, you know, pro junior sports, drag racing seems pretty archaic when we start to look at what we advertise for those type things. So that's kind of the explanation I guess I had. So you had some thoughts and some ideas on this, right? And that's how we kind of spawned this discussion to go Absolutely. sideways from our main yes. topic. But Yes, to go sideways exactly from our main topic. So I thought about this very much. You know, just over time, you just think about different things you can do with, and how realistic it is. And for some racetracks, it's like these ideas are not right. Racetracks, depending on your location, on what your market is, on whatever else that's going on, like you, you physically cannot or financially it will not make sense. Um, some ideas that it also came up in comments there are, you know, restaurants yeah. at racetracks. It doesn't need to be right beside the racetrack or by any means, but you have a racetrack on or a restaurant on site. So it works the same, right? Most places have like a canteen or something similar. So you have a restaurant that's the canteen, yeah. right? Have that type of setup, <clears throat> but a restaurant that can stay open all year long, right? Yeah. If, if it, if you're in the right location, if you're in the right demographic, if you're close to a city or whatever it is, you know, so you have that attraction that just when there's not a race, somebody that might never come to a racetrack can come, you know, they go and they're like, oh, well, what goes on over there? Well, we should come back and check it out or something like that, you know. So that gets new people in because everybody eats. Um, 
So that, well, just, that was the, and if you're a multiplex, I mean, you've got something to work with too, exactly. right? Like you see exactly. so many places that have multiple motorsports or, you know, they're venue oriented, right. Where they do concert things. Like there's ideas behind these type of things that make a lot of sense, right? Like yeah. VIP type viewing areas that really have VIP type of treatment exactly. in the sense of the combinations. Like, again, I know there's a business side to this, right? You certainly got to make this make sense. If it doesn't yes. make money, what's the point of the investment? But you don't see a lot of it. The only places you really see it are the really, really high end tracks. Even at those ones, those are closed. Like, you know, you don't see these VIP areas used at middle of the road tracks. They're just open to others. Like, yeah. Again, I don't want to speak out of place because I certainly don't own a facility, but, you know, Butch got it. It was, yeah. oh, first yes. round lounge. Sorry. I saw what this. It's called, but yes, yeah. the loser's lounge is. Yeah. That was, that, that's the name we would probably yeah. use, yeah. right? When we got it. But yeah, like I, I think you see more of this. I think that's that's that yeah, general discussion of like the other ideas out there, the ways to expand on utilization of the facility. And, and don't get me wrong, I mean, I'm quasi excited to go to Napierville because I was like there's a restaurant right beside the racetrack. Like, I'm not a breakfast dude, right? I'll, I'll give you out there. We talk about our our pre race things. I'm not the guy that's going to mm -hmm. go breakfast. I'm going for breakfast because how else? How many times are you going to jump in the golf cart and drive next door and go have breakfast somewhere? Yeah. Right. Like yeah. these little things, like, and you can do these things at tracks, right? So I'm, I'm kind of it's thinking, neat, like, yeah, right? it's neat, right? Yeah. So like that's that's the big thing I think is if there is a chance for it, it would be really cool. Yeah. You know, and then same like a bar, restaurant kind of kind of area, like what Edgewater did is just brilliant. You know, like and one then, of the places thrown out was Empire, right? When I, when I threw it out there, there's a lot of people throwing Empire Dragway in New York, right? That this has the chance, like that was one of those places where the idea was thrown out. Like maybe that's a place where you could have an all year round restaurant. Like town, yeah. town isn't that far. You're yeah. not way out in the middle of nowhere. You know, um, maybe a harder pitch for some tracks because you you, you aren't close to quote unquote town. You're not going to well, get that's right. customers yeah. outside of track, right? Yeah. But that's a place. I mean, and I've been in their tower. Like they have a lounge up there. They use the security cameras to help um, broadcast the event. Like, you can watch the race from their VIP lounge with the security cameras they use 24 seven to keep an eye on the facility when they're not there. I'm like yeah. the technology to be able to put a bar together, a restaurant. I prefer restaurant just cause I like the idea of, I like know, the, the idea that sounds better. Yeah. You know, you want a place like it's bars kind of a weird place to go take your kid for hey, three hours to go watch racing and hang out. Yeah. But you yeah. know, the restaurant concept, but like you can set up all the cameras you're going to view. Here. This is like going to a major junior sports event and being able to watch the game, you know, in a VIP seating area. Right. Um, for sure. I, I just, it starts to make too much sense unless someone can give me legitimate numbers to show me like, this is just insane. Yeah. In which yeah. case. And I'm that's like, like no. cause somewhere like, like Luskville, right. We talked about that. Luskville is not going to have a restaurant there that operates year round because there is not traffic there. You yeah. know, the yeah. traffic in that area, there's a campground down the road, can't use it in the winter time. And there is a, you know, the racetrack only can be used in yep. the summer anyways. Yep. So you have a few people that live in that area, but not enough for, yeah. for a full scale thing for this, but like, you know, somewhere else, you know, that could be close. Potentially that is, and, and, you know, we're yep. not talking about anywhere in specific, we're just talking about ideas here. Yeah. Yep. Uh, like, so TMP great... gets the closest one, I think, cause they've got that track side bar. Yeah. It's open air, right? It's still a the bar. Black right? cat. The black cat. I don't know cat. if it's still called the black cat. I don't know if it still is, but no, it's it was a long time ago. I think. I think yeah. it's still called that, but it's probably not the proper name for it. Not the but, proper uh, one. Yeah. yeah. But like, nonetheless, I mean, there's another, like that, you know, that works. I've been a while ago. I was like, that's a pretty crazy idea, but it's never, it's always busy. Even on medium weekends, it's still the place to go hang out. Yeah. Um, because it's a great location right beside the track. It's open air, but at least it's out of the sun and you can get beverages. They do some barbecuing again. These are just ideas that like, I have to admit the conversation had it happened probably sooner, I would have said this was a bit of our topic this week because I, I think you can go pretty in depth on all the yeah, little extra yeah. things that would be cool to see, right? But yeah, uh, it was worth yeah. a good uh, mini topic, right? Well, that's it. And like, so the other, I just want to throw my other ideas for it: <clears throat> uh, convenience store or something like that. Uh, you know, everybody rolls in with their motorhome and all the other stuff. You forget one little thing, you know. All right, go grab it at the convenience store, or you don't have to bring you know you know the racetrack's gonna have this this and this yeah. so you don't have to bring as much you don't have to stress about getting everything in the motorhome loaded up it's gonna be present if you need it for for certain things you know ice is a massive one obviously but but all those different 
kind of amenities, I guess. Yep. Yeah. That come in a store like that or in a general store. Doesn't need to be massive. You know, you don't need to be the metro down the road. It, it's it's gas station store type stuff. Exactly. Like you're exactly. the track and didn't have margarine yeah. and needed margarine. You have no idea how much that's worth. I've had weekends almost broken down because margarine was not in the fridge. Like Dude, there you things, go. But there you go. go. And then you said gas station. If a gas station's out front, what do racers need? Not just for the race cars, for the rigs, for the yeah. trucks, trailer, you know, not the trailer, but you know what I'm saying. Um, everybody needs fuel. If you can leave your house and get fuel once you get to the racetrack or get fuel on your way out, mint, especially these multi-race events or multi-day events, you know, then yeah. you have, you know, your generators are running all week. This is running. This is running. You know, you have that set up there that you can then, you know, fuel your stuff up right at the track. And that's all, you know, the idea is to make more money for the racetrack yeah. while <clears throat> satisfying a need for the racers, yep. you know, so you make less stops on your way to the track and, and it's more efficient the whole way. So yep. different yeah, ideas, absolutely. different ideas. Absolutely. I know, I know, uh, you know, if truck fan is still watching, <laughs> I wanted to do this at Shannonville, you know, I, I'm trying not to throw all my golden ideas because, you know, then everybody's going to start taking, you know, the, my money makers, you know, but Barker uh, Motorsports Park opens that's right. and have no ideas left. That's right. right. But the, the old, uh, the, the Fabby tower, Shannonville, the, like I wanted to make that into a bar for years. Yeah. It's right. Probably 500 feet down the track sits up. It's enclosed. I'm like, Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> just some ideas. Like you said, we could talk about this for hours. Oh yeah, I, that's it. There's there's a topic here, right? It's just it came up after the fact that we posted. Yeah, everything. yeah, so. yeah. And that's all good. So yeah. we'll get into the actual topic. Yep. Uh, to up tonight, how to maximize your buy runs, time trials, practice, whatever, yep. whatever you want to describe it as. When we had Matt Cospel on last weekend or last week, uh, we spoke a lot about about buy runs and utilizing them in those big events and and how he was looking at them and he was really proving him numbers to himself during the buy run. Yeah. You know, and, and I think it'd be fair to open this up a little bit too, just practice in general leading into, because I had yes. that conversation was kind of neat. It's like, you know, like he comes out there and wins a big race off the trailer. And it's like, man, you must've been hitting the tree all winter. Like you didn't put it down from September till, you know, the week you left. And, and, you know, it was basically, no, nah, I started a couple weeks beforehand and then just ramped up as yeah. I got closer. Yeah. Well, fooled me because the scorecard looked like was good. You slept with this at night, like it was yeah. in your hands yeah. while you're passed out because he was lights out. And I have to admit, it was kind of neat to think that because I feel guilty all the time. I mean, the practice tree sits right beside me. It's it's just to my left here, and yeah, I don't hit it nearly as much as I figured I should. Yet I find as you lead into an event, right? You hit it a few times, get geared up, and and I'm really not that rusty, right? So it was kind of neat to have that conversation though. Like I'm not sitting there alone. I'm thinking how many other people have that same mentality of I don't do enough or I don't work on yeah. this enough. And the reality is that, you know, that may not be a problem depending on how prepared you feel. So yeah, it was kind of a whole conversation that spurred off. This is, you know, practice, right? There's 10,000 things that we can screw up between how to get the car to the lanes to making and executing a run to stopping the different ways we get after this right yeah yeah and you know in the famous words of you know alan iverson we're talking about practice <laughs> right now is what we're talking about yeah um we you and i had spoke a lot before for some different ideas just random yeah. conversation that kind of comes up uh for time runs because we'll start with that right we'll start yeah. in you know the early part of the day time runs go out time runs can be and i think for 90% might be a lot, yeah. but it might also not be enough. But for 90% of racers, I'm going to say are useless. Yeah. You know, you well, make think... the, you make the run. All right. You get your slip. Yeah. You look at it, but you're not learning from yeah. it. You're not really learning what you can, you know, in doing this. And so something I learned actually, it was, um, it was Kyle Jessup who actually had brought it up to me the first time um, a while ago now. We'd line up for time runs. You have a general idea what your car is going to run. You know, you, I, I hope if you have a completely new setup, then, you, you know, here's That's along different. for the ride. Yep. But uh, for the most part, you have a general idea of what you're going to run. So we'll, choose, we'll put dial-ins in the car yep. 
and do it and let go on the top and then you know so your light comes up slow do the yeah. math figure out what what your reaction time actually was and then we had a chance to drive the finish line or look at the finish line and get that view going in your mind at the start of a fresh race day yep because yep. i will especially on the years you know when you know i've made 400 450 laps in a, in one single season you can't get lazy with it yep. Yep. like because once you start getting lazy then you're you're done you know the hey, wind tended. lights are gonna stop yep. you know so you stay on that stay focused stay kind of vigilant the whole time yep. and the benefits are are massive right when you when you are being productive every round down the track time yeah. run elimination run and I think that's, and that's, that's one of those angles, right? Like gets, gets you up in the seat, gets you, your head working. Right. Cause I think like going back on the time trial aspect, right. I, I think I, I try to use them. I'd use them in a different angle. Right. And I'll get into that in a sec, but like you, if you're not utilizing it to learn something, if you're just flat out going up, making passes, then if you're not getting anything from that, you there's, there's severe loss of value in what that run really represents. Right. Like if you just yeah. want to see what the car runs, that's fine. At what point do you take that run and go, okay, how good do I know the car? Right. Because there's lots of scenarios. And and I guess the difference I want to bring up here is the difference between local racing and, and so maybe the bigger scene racing, right? Like local racing, you're gonna get your couple time trials, then you're gonna go into round one. There's probably buybacks. Yeah. Like you're gonna have three or four chances before you have to start making one and done type passes. Correct. Right. Where every pass is there is no next round unless you turn on a wind light. And in that the case, yeah, you, that's where you get laziness. That's where you can get that, that, you know, what you're just making laps to make laps until it counts. But if you're not learning something from that, I think you're, you're losing the opportunity to pick up on info. Whereas you go to big money races, you might not get a time trial. You have to come off the trailer, knowing what you're doing, blind passes, or maybe you get one run, but the next run ain't going to be for another four or five hours. What have you learned from that one run? And, and something years ago that I got into the habit of. Every pass I make, whether it's off the trailer, whether it's a second time trial, whether it's a fourth time trial, that car has a number in my head that we have made a prediction on. Um, mm -hmm. Those who know me, I rely a lot on on uh, my crew chief weather station. Like I use weather station, I use prediction software. I'm very confident. I like it. That's you know, that's my mo. Is is I'm strong on that math front. We work a lot with the cars. I have a number. Now that first time trial, we roll out there, and that number, you know, we hit it. All right. If we get a second run, I want to go back out there. And that second run might be three or four hours later. It might be 20 minutes later. I want to make another prediction. I want to hit it. And if I can do that, I have a lot of confidence that what we're going to do here today is that the car is predictable. Like going into round one, if I need to put an honest dial in on it because it's getting chased hard or I want to carry four uh, or five for whatever reason, um, that I know what's going to happen, right? Flip side, if it doesn't, if we're way out to lunch, a, I am glad now we know that. Like that's not a round one decision of, yeah. you know, is this car going to do what I think it's going to do? And if we're way out to lunch, we have a time to try to figure out what happened. The second run, or if that next round is round one and it's got buybacks, a, take that info and we roll with it. As I think any natural person would, like, okay, we're, you know, we went six forty. All right, we're probably going to dial six forty if the air doesn't change. Well maybe you want to hold a couple because there's a reason you slowed up and maybe you haven't quite figured that out. Maybe there's an error characteristic. Like that's what I'm practicing. This is what I'm learning from. Right. Um, but to your point of seeing the finish line, right? Like you go into round one, if it's been a couple weeks off that rate of closure, that ability to look that, that, you know, round one's your first chance to do that. That can be a little tough. Yeah. Right. You know, there's been lots of races where round one and two, the numbers are real loose at the finish line. And by the time you get to round four or five, if you've been on, you know, you feel well practiced, you feel prepared, you know? So imagine going into a weekend, having done that beforehand, or at least getting a run where you can see it, you got your brain engaged now. Right. Um, these are things I think that, that, you know, these time trials, if you're not using it to just figure out things or work on the car, you can use to get yourself prepared, right? That uh, oftentimes again, this just looks past. Yeah. So we've hit on time runs. We'll go back a little bit as to before you get to the racetrack and everybody talks about, you know, your practice trip as if that's all you have. That's the only thing you can do. It's not, that's not the only thing I focus on. You know, we hit it, right? We spoke about that last week. We'll walk by, I'll grab it and I'll, I'll hit bang five or six out or whatever 
and go for there. But <clears throat> I keep myself on it with that. And when I see I can stay consistent yep. and have very like confidence in, in what I'm still doing here. And then you get, you're going to get in the race car. I'm going to get amped up and me, you know, whatever. And I, I feel good about that. Right. This yeah. year and most years, you know, I'm, I don't feel like I'm going to be lost yeah. when I, when I go get in the car for letting go. It's the other things. And you can adjust that throughout the year. Yeah. You can, you're going to let go. I don't know, an average year. I'm not sure for every, like, let's say you're going to let go 150, 200 times in a year. And you can start using the practice at any time and, and do different stuff. So you're going to get a lot of that. What you're not going to get a lot of is situations of mentally preparing for a game plan yeah. at the finish line or in your dial in or whatever. And sorry, I, Got distracted by the the question there, uh, Mike Doe. What's a good practice tree brand? Porta tree. Uh, we do have some in stock. All these yeah. auto. Send me a message. Send Brack Life a message. We get set up. Um, but you only have so many chances to get a game plan for what you're going to do on the racetrack, right? In situational, whatever you know. Like okay, I have if if I'm running a six second door car, right? Well, yeah. I want. This year, right now, I'm going to plan that if I have a 450 dragster, this is my game plan. Yeah. You need to mentally exercise yourself to understand what your game plan is, why you're going to do it, yeah. right? And, and how to execute it and how it's going to work. So um, there's so much more into it. Yourself, myself, we're both members, you know, this Bracket Racing Elite. Yep. Yep. That can be... I know a bunch of people watching on here are as well. Um, sorry, reading comments again. Michael Beard on a red light run, drive the strike for practice. Absolutely. Exactly. Right. Another free run that you don't want to just waste. Yeah. Um, but, you know, TIBR Elite, for just one example, there's a bunch of racing schools yeah. out there. I know Scotty does one. I think, believe there's a couple on the West Coast that I, I've seen of. Um, but get in those communities. Talk to people about ideas you have watch videos there's lots of youtube stuff on there as well um elite can be overwhelming because there is so much and it's such a massive community yeah um but that's there's, you know sorry and there's a lot to take in there right like that's yeah. the things like so you talk about you know so you know we're talking about the mental preparation practice right of, of situations and, and that's i think something big you can get into because it's um you know, met being having scenarios in your head of how things unfold, like working through that is something that we often don't think of. I think a lot of times until you're like in a staging lanes with someone and depending on how you get paired up, you may only have a short period of time to figure out an execution game plan, right? Like yeah. how would I react in this situation? Right. And, and sometimes there is no preparation. I mean, you get days where things are just going sideways, but you're turning on wind lights. You, you, what are you going to do in January? Figure out like, yeah, I'm, I'm dealing with a, transmission that's acting funny so i need a scenario of how i'm going to hold six against a car that's going 620 as i'm going you know uh 540 or 520 yeah. like it's not going to exist right but the ability uh to to come up and pre-plan a little bit and think about these things scenarios right is 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 a good way to kind of practice out being prepared i've been for that i really really like taking like as my mike said taking those advantages of races where it's a gimme whether you've given it away whether your opponent has given it away right of going down there and executing maybe a slightly different plan you know you had the one that was going to win the round right or in your mind going to win the round you've got a red light so you've got a freebie or just a throwaway depending which way it goes try something different for a second or try exactly what your plan is depending on how confident you are about what you're trying to do practice executing something right you're going to have a round that at this point has no consequence to you. So you might as well learn something from it, right? Whether it's good, yeah. bad, or indifferent, um, roll down there and do that. So take that plan you had back there. I've had rounds where I've gone red and okay, well, I was holding five and going to go down there and try to be ahead and yeah, you know, like be ahead double O something. So either try to do it, or if I'm just angry about something, go down there and okay, how do I get rid of this five differently now? Like learn something from this, right? Yeah, both had a few times where I just go down there and be like, "This thing better go five under." Like, just go dead zero on my yeah. predicted five under type of scenario because yeah. I'm so angry about going red. But 
again, learn from this, like find opportunities. Cause that's the one thing our sport doesn't afford us is, is the ability to go out there and practice a bunch, right. In a manner that isn't overly expensive because correct, you don't get in the car and make runs for nothing. Right. Uh, yeah. you know, so try to make every pass worth something, um, yeah. on that, but the, the ability to have that tough time in the season to go through things, right. Reading like the, this is bracket racing and the other groups. There is a lot of off season. Well, I get off season for us because a lot of other people are on season. Here's yeah. a scenario. What would you do different? Okay. This is good mental exercise. This is a good mental practice of what they did. How would you react to that? Right. Mike's got a lot of comments coming in here. I haven't read many of them yet, um, but I feel like there's a lot of importance there because they're big comments. There are, there are some good ones. Yeah. The beard's always got good comments. Absolutely. Uh, Andrew, you, you kind of talked about it, like, about the practice, right? It's not like we're playing hockey or playing basketball that I can just go out in the driveway, you know, and yeah. then, and, you know, shoot baskets or, or practice shooting or do whatever it is you do. Um, the option for real practice is you have to rent the racetrack, yeah. you know, or yeah. you find a test day or you go there, you know, and show up with no competition yeah. there. It is strictly to be productive. Yeah. I'd love to do. I, I've said this to Mike it had to be a month ago now. I'm like, man, if I could have at this point in time with what I, I feel I know or what ideas I have, if I could go somewhere for a day or two days and just make laps that I want to make of productive ones yep. and figure out how to kill this much, what this does, what does that do? You know, and learn then without having, you know, giving up some rounds. You know what I'm saying? I, is... I, I had this before and it's kind of, I've never known how I felt about what was said. Um, Adam Bitsanis was talking about trying different things, right? You know, you know, there's the destroyer is always messing with something, yeah. right? Good or bad. Has awesome equipment, takes him some time usually to, to figure out when he does change the setup. But he said to me, he's like, people will not sacrifice wind lights, a couple wind lights for a long-term game, yeah. right? So, so like to learn something new, to try something different, whatever that may be. And that's me yeah. to a certain degree, right? Because like I found success doing what I was doing yeah. so that I'm like, I really want to learn this other skill over here, whatever that may be. But I don't, I don't want to do it while I'm racing yeah. until I'm comfortable with it, you know, because I feel I shouldn't have to sacrifice wind lights because I can, I can win whenever yeah. doing what I'm already doing. But does that make me a better racer? It stunts your growth. Like yes. in, it's reality of it, right? Because I, I had this conversation many, many years ago, uh, Jamie Bridge, we, we were talking about uh, just, you know, holding numbers and how that's where that scene went to. And um mike just so you know mike beard you made a great point about the bracket racers test and tune you hit it on before we could get to it because that's yeah. where i was going with this actually yeah. on, on a plan that i was putting together but it, mike's comment was you know, a couple of times i've hosted a bracket racers test and tune testing in full race mode with dial-ins but you you know get to keep going win or lose uh, i think the advertised event at edgewater i think has a time trial like that uh set up but so uh talk to jamie he goes like you know you got to go out there and you got to learn to lose like you're going to go out there and practice something you're going to hold numbers and lose and i got to admit at the time we were on a roll it was during a a, a, a few years there where you know we were i felt pretty unbeatable and, and to an extent kind of was and i'm like i'm not going out there and, and i get what he's getting at that skill needs to be learned because i think that just makes you better to know the tool and toolbox but I, i'm not going out there to sacrifice wins to learn something. I'm like, there's gotta be another way. I, I've always had this idea that, you know, I'm, I'm the smart, lazy student. I try to be good at what I do, but I want to find the easiest way to figure it out. I want to do this the hard, tried and true way. There's gotta be an angle to see yeah. an angle to cut here. And it took a lot of years, but the reality was what we started talking about what Michael had mentioned was, you know, go get a test day, find a test day. And, and that's, you know, I, I've been a preacher for years that the, the open test and tune days on Saturdays, the trace tracks and Sundays and this and that Fridays, like they're good places to go make a couple shakedown runs. They are a terrible place to go really learn anything, right? Because yeah. you're never going to make enough runs on a good racing surface in a condition. That's really what you're going to race on. It's a great place to go figure out if it starts and stops and runs and runs anywhere close to the number. 
but track rentals, right? And and ones that were broken down. I mean, if you could say a couple hundred dollars, you go out there and learn what's going to take you three or four weekends of learning or zero wind lights over a month, but you could figure that out in a day. Is that not worth the $200 in a divided up rental? Because you can go out there and put dial-ins on the board. You want to learn how to hold five. How do you scrub five in your car? Not in your buddy's car, not what yeah. your friend Joe says, not what your friend, you know, uh, uh, Mike says. Like, how do you do it in yours? Because every car is different. The well, reality is go out and do it. And do it without the consequence of the wind light or, the, or, or coming on or not making your day better or worse. Because you get to mm -hmm. go there and do it again. I'm a big proponent of muscle memory training. I think it, I'm not saying it's the way for everyone, but I, it's, it's the tool that I use when I practice on the tree, it's go make 25 hits. I know that doesn't sound realistic in the real world, but the reality is I need to train my brain to do something without thinking. Well, if you can jump in a car and go down there and learn how to execute scrubbing five, because the reality is to an extent, you're not looking at what your opponent's doing. You're trying to scrub your own numbers, do what you need to do, and then make a, a, a judgment on that. You need to be able to do it. And you need to be able to do it without thinking about it and know how you've done it. And that's where these type of, of practices come up that, that we don't do a lot of, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's so it, There's so many different aspects to what we can do and what we can you know, really accomplish. The more and more we talk about it, I really wish I had a practice day. Um, I, I got not, one coming it, up. I'll tell you about it, but it's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't rent it. I'm just trying to piggyback it. Right. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, something else. Oh, sorry. We got different messages. And Producer everything Rachel just lots of lots message. talking. Yep. Um, so there's, there's other ways to stay sharp that I find. And I, I found this a lot. I, I think we talked about this on here before about using video games before to keep your, yeah. keep your mind and eyes sharp. Cause I, I always found that when I was younger, right. I, you know, was never a massive call of duty player or anything like that. But like we played a little bit with buddies and stuff like that growing up yep. and how much it worked, your, your coordination with where your hands were moving, what your eyes were seeing. So it, and your reaction, right. It goes hand in hand with what we were doing on the tree. So, you know, a little older now, got a little, a little more going on. Uh, I found the same with. You can't uh, use that as a twenty-something. Like I'll be honest. No, no, no. I know, I know. I know. You gotta call me out on. Yeah. yeah like, I'm not. You know, we're not seventeen anymore. <laughs> I don't have. I don't have time in my life to play Call of Duty anymore. So what I do play, and this will make it maybe sound older. Uh, I have a solitaire game on my phone. And that's what I'll do, and I can do. Do this, you know, the solitaire board, yeah. in a minute and 30 seconds or like the quickest, like a minute and 10 seconds, I can solve the solitaire board. And that's, you know, moving your hands, your mind's working, your eyes are working, everything's staying sharp to do that. And it sounds silly, but that's going to relate to how it is on the racetrack yeah. because you are programming yourself to be trained to mentally think fast, mentally make decisions fast. Yeah. Right. And figure yeah. out what, you know, have a strategy to what you want to do, what you're going to do, and then just mentally go back to that all the time, you know? So that, that's, that's... It's, it's, it's keeping it sharp, right? Like it, it's, it's keeping in that, yeah. evaluating the situation, creating, you know, a, a movement, creating some sort of action, acting on that action, and then yeah. reacting to what that yeah. action created. You know, yeah. that's not fundamental breakdown of what a pass is like in, in a car. I'm not sure you know what is right. Yeah. It, it's about keeping sharp. I mean, I, we talked about this with the, uh, you know, in between runs, like I, those epically long days, I can't shut my brain down to go have a nap. I just don't get back up. Like, unless yeah. you give me three hours to get the brain rolling again, I can't shut yeah. it down. It's like an old 1990s computer. It's about four hours to reboot. And even at that, it still ain't sharp after it's got up and running. So you can't shut down. And and I have to admit when I was, you know, you were telling me this and watching it at some of the events we've been to, right. You, you don't spend five hours doing nothing. You spend five hours between runs staying, you know, mentally alert. Yeah. Some guys go out there and they're doing jumping jacks for three hours trying to keep the blood. Like there's different ways to, and the key part, I think to this is the takeaway is find what keeps you sharp, find, find a way to be sharp, what you need to, right. If that's a problem and, and you know, that's a problem. I think for a lot of us is we get a little lackadaisical between runs and we don't get re-engaged. 
right? We weekends were like, yeah, I saw everything. I was on it. Well, what was happening? Well, I was going in circle with my hair on fire. Well, you never had a time to disengage. So you stayed sharp. So how do you yep. figure out how to do that in between runs? What are you doing? Some people hit the practice tree. I hate doing that. If I found the tree, I do not want to look at a practice tree in my trailer. I won't. I hate to even acknowledge it exists because I don't want to go and mess up whatever I got going on. Flip side is going to the finish line and watching some racing take place, like watching rate of closure just to keep the brain roll. Like there's a thousand ways to do this. You just got to identify what your weakest points are. Identifying yeah. strong points is, is great. Yeah. Identifying weak points to, and practicing on those. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and even the practice being keeping your brain active, like maybe that's the thing you need to do. Maybe staying up till 4 a.m. partying so the next day, you know, you're lagging isn't yeah. good practice, right? Like, yeah. but there are ways to, like, you need to identify these things and figure these out. Because if you do, you're way further ahead when you get to race day. Because back to, I do not want to sacrifice runs to learn. Yeah. But I also don't want to sacrifice runs to learn hard mistake. Like, to learn on the hard way, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to sacrifice any runs, right? And then, but not being prepared, you are then inherently going to sacrifice runs by doing dumb things. Yep. And you're going to do dumb things anyways, right? You're going to mess up the finish line or you're going to mess up this or mess up that. And that that's just life. But yep. things that you can be more prepared for is not what I want to be sacrificing wind lights yep. for. Yep. You know, yep. so you kind of kind of take that as much as, as you can. And as far as you can, as far as you want to, yep. you know, for different yep. things. So there's so much that does go on and, and, you know, that's the, sorry, the neat part. Yeah. So maybe this. one of the things we'll touch on, cause I, we, we kind of glanced through it was like the buy run option, the single option, right. For practice. Right. You see yeah. some people like Matt talked about, you know, I haven't been in the other lane the whole time. So I want to move over lane, make a hit. Right. I think that's something yeah. else like just strategy on the single, right. It was yeah. one of those things where late rounds, what are you going to do? I'm going to move over a lane. Cause I haven't been over there all day. I want to figure out what's happened over there. And he, now he pulled some information out of that. Mm -hmm. um, normally late round buy runs for me are simply just to be frank, waste for me to not give up information. I'm going to do something like go lift at the, uh, you know, for quarter mile racing, I'm lifting at the thousand foot, right. Putting an ambiguous number on the board because for some reason, everyone in my mind, when I'm down to five cars or three cars is a spy looking for some sort of Intel that I, probably already gave yeah. them willingly yeah. but i'm not going to give it up here other times it's you know let's go try something right mm -hmm. um plan to see it i've had times where i've gone out in a buy run going 892 893 it's what like an honest dial in is i'll put 917 on the dial in and lift it a thousand foot because i'm like yeah i think if i last time i lifted a thousand foot we were like 913 to 914 so let's put a number on the board and try to hit it and you know, i think one time i went in 17 with a zero on a 17 coasting and it was like well you know, that worked we, out. We, we learned how to carry a 10th and a little bit more, almost two yeah. pence, right? By lifting a thousand. But, and you know, do you have a strategy on, on the buy run? Like, are you looking to learn anything? Or are you looking to just not give away Intel? Right. I mean, yeah. that's a good way to practice like Matt did, or sometimes it's a good way to just take a good lap. What do you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, it depends on the day. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get to the three thirty lift or I'll, you know, if I'm rolling and it's going to lay it, you know, if I personally think I can just lay it dead on, then I'll just go out there and lay it dead on. Yeah. Right. And then let them think, you know, which is backing up. Like, going you know, on. You am know? I, I, am I dialed right? Am I dialed? Like, am yeah. I, is my yeah. whip right? Cause if you can sometimes go four or five rounds using run completion as the only method to figure yeah. out where you're at. Right. Because yeah. you've been down there. So, yeah. And that's how that was, that falls into my next uh, point is all this practice is fine. All the, the ideas, all the different things you want to try, all that stuff, that's all fine. But if you go do this and the next weekend, wait a minute, if I, I lifted here and then I went that and then I did this or wait, was, what did I run again? You have no idea what you're doing, yeah. right? You can't just go make aimless practice and not record any of these results, right? You have to, yeah. you know. For if you want to get into it and you know to be straight up with it, you need a logbook yeah if you want to be yeah. you know get to that next level yeah. stuff a lot of guys can be successful without it and that's fine that's great for a certain style of racing and if you've got it and you can just go out and you know yeah. 
pull it out and that, that's awesome. But if you can't, if you need to work on, if you need to learn more and, and write these things down, use your logbook productively, keep notes, yeah. you know, heavy notes, you know, or, or whatever you need, you know, just to, to stay reminded of keep, that. Get, get into the practice of getting information written down yeah. or recorded in whatever manner. And that's, that's yeah. a good point, right? I mean, it's still hitting the word practice out there, right? Cause to be yeah. honest with you, that's one of those things. I mean, I used to see, um, Lancaster was was just this hotbed of races uh, where these guys raced there every week. They knew this track like the back of their hand because they were there every Friday. Um, no one, I mean, everyone had logbooks. No one had air stations. I couldn't figure out how, how are these guys so good without an air station, right? Back when that stuff really came around, and the, like reality was, they got logbooks, not not like two or three. They've got depths of these things, and they've got notes on top of notes, and it just became one of those deals where their their best practice was recording every little thing they knew what was going to happen before it happened they didn't know what reason caused it you know at 5 30 the track slows down when it's cloudy well the reality was it was probably getting humid because of the cloud cover coming out from over the lake right yeah but they had that note they had the ability to go back right it was good practice for them, so they knew exactly what was going to happen right and and reality was you take that and roll back with it and you can use that that's a you know, something to get into. And that's something that as you do more of, you start to see patterns, like you can identify issues or you just identify situations better. Right. Yeah. Um, great thing to start doing. Right. Well, and, and yeah. it keeps you sharp. Like I tend to be careful with what I do between runs. Like I don't like to get into too much analysis of what I'm doing Yeah. because I find I'll get lost all of a sudden, you know, round four to the lanes. And I've spent the last 30 minutes and analyzing the last two days and realized I have no game plan for what's in front of me. I reserve that for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday after a race, yeah. right? Post race yeah. analysis, right? Go through the notes, figure out what good, bad, or indifferent, right? Because it's a good practice to figure that out. Because all of a sudden it's like, I don't know what happened around three, but I was too busy to figure it out at that moment. But I need to go back and analyze what Come happened. Up with between, an idea. Yeah, two to three to figure out how I mixed time I can get to four in that entry. Or if I did get to four, just how lucky was I to avoid that? Because yeah. I want to be good. I'd rather you know, figure that out later. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's good. Right. There's a million ways to practice. There's a million ways to, you know, get better or improve or just, you know, adjust little things. And yeah. wherever you try, whether that's a tune up, whether that's your mental game, whether it's trying all the practice street, whatever, you know, and you can take this with the level of competition. I mean, like I, you know, we're, we're overtly serious about what we do, right? Like this. Yeah. You'd probably have a tough time discerning whether this is our full-time job or just something we really enjoy doing based on how serious we take it. And then not everyone needs to be on that same level. That's not, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, I think if you want to be at a certain level, there's a certain amount of seriousness you need to take to how you approach preparing, practicing and things like that. On the flip side, if you're having fun with this, right, you do as much as it still makes it fun. Yeah. Right? Cause like, you know, and, and maybe that's all you need, right. Hitting the practice tree for just a little bit while you're, you know, just hanging out or you just want to be a comfortable racer, right? Either way, a little bit of practice like that just makes it more fun if you're better on the tree, yep. right? If you become more competitive by just adjusting a couple little things, like that's worth it just yep. for the fun of being there. Yep. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think if you're, if you're in this, even a little bit competitively, like the fact that I've seen very few people who've been in something competitive who didn't see or want to have some form of, of, you know, improvement, finding a way to get better at it. Right. Yeah. Uh, regardless of whether they felt like, you know, they were already close to the ceiling or not. Um, everyone's looking for something to be able to get, how to get a little bit better. Right. And, uh, um, Mike's got a lot of great points coming up. I think some of these are a little bit too long to pull up on the screen now that I'm reading through some of them, right. When he talks to you about evaluation but, and practice of yeah. where you're at, but, but check um, out the comments, right. When you're, when you're done here, you know, read through the comments, see everything that's talked about, because there, there's so much great information out there. Yeah. And so many things that might seem kind of elementary, yep. but, you know, maybe it, it does have a yep. huge impact, you know, on what you're doing. Yep. So we should add Mike. I almost feel like Mike's been our, uh, our like co-host on this one, just from the chat forum. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, it's been good. It's, it's actually some study, like some awesome ones, right? Like the one that I'm looking at right now, is like, you know, study the layout of the track, note which flags you can and cannot trust flags close to the tower are subject to swirling air or something blocking from a particular direction or for a flag. 
this is grand bend written all over it. I'm sure that's not what Michael was writing, but like the first thing I thought of when I looked, it's like, which flag can you trust? Right? Well, that's a grand bendism. If you've ever raced out there, you're going to have wind coming from every which direction, depending on how the walls around the track are funneling it. Yeah. But back to the, you know, studying, figuring things out, right. Getting to the place, right. And, and, and sorting out what you need to know. He also had a great comment that I almost wanted to leave the show on because it tied into your food one very well. Maybe you can grab that one about uh, his attention span. Because uh, oh yes, I did see that. You one see right what I'm talking about there? We'll find it. We'll find it. Yeah, because it uh, it ties together our mini subject at the start with our main topic of uh, um, practicing and and or just being at the racetrack and uh, how to stay in in the zone. There we go. You got it. I don't have that big of an attention span. I go find a barbecue place. See, yeah. there Just, you go. If it's on site, your thing. don't have to go far. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> when it's there, it's so easy. You know, Yeah. it's all full circle. This whole episode, went, it just went full circle with that one. Yeah, we're coming uh, around with that one. So yeah, so. absolutely. Sounds good, right? Yep. It was good. Yeah, I was I, happy with that one. That one turned I think it's in, lots of neat stuff, know? right? Like it was a discussion that like, honest to God, when when we, we talked to Matt and the little things we touched on, I mean, there weren't things that I think they were like almost out of the blue questions, but they got me thinking hard. And I'm always glad that it was an unscheduled show because it gave us less than a week to come right back around with stuff yeah. that, you know, was fresh from that episode because uh, yeah. it really got me thinking for the last few days, right? Of, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's like, I, I actually felt I'd be honest with you. It made me leave that episode feeling better about my lack of hitting the tree. Yeah. Yeah. You know, leading into the start of the season. Cause I just, I stare at it every time I'm sitting here going through notes, doing work at my desk going like yeah. tomorrow, tomorrow's the day I start. Right. Yeah. Like a diet yeah. almost. And it just never happened. Whereas now two weeks out. Yeah. I'll probably get off here tonight and we'll go hit 25 times. Look terrible, but no, tomorrow will be better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this will be the comment we do finish with uh, my kicky Barker's burgers. He gets it. He gets it, man. <laughs> there you go. Nothing, nothing that I like better than on ra on race day than a nice cheeseburger. Good call. You better look out. You see me walking around with those in the morning. Uh, so that'll be that for this week. Uh, QR code on the screen there. Shop Brack Life Apparel. Mother's Day is coming up. In case yeah. you were unaware, for anybody yeah. else paying attention on here, May fourteenth. Yes, May fourteenth. That is five days away. That's a big day. So really four days because the ninth is done. So yeah. And depending on when you're listening to this, even less depending on. Right? Yeah. So that's right. That's right. Cause be aware. Yeah. So pay attention to that. We yeah. have lots of stuff up there. We have some, yeah. you know, great. Look great after items, mom. Mom's an important yeah. part. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so th thanks, Andrew. Thanks again for everything. Thanks. Let's dragway. As I said, at the beginning of the show, two weeks, May long weekend, Victoria day, five grand win, uh, Super Pro Saturday, 2,500 Sunday, 1,000 to win both days. Semi-Pro Junior Dragsters will also be there. Check that out as well. Like, this just kicks off a wicked season at Lustville yeah. once again. Um, I don't know how many five granders we have this year. Last year, there was five grand or more. I think it was 12 events mm -hmm. last year. It's mm -hmm. only went up. I want to say we're closer to 15 or 16 events paying five grand. Or more, just about every, yeah. I get when I look at the schedule, it didn't seem like there was many that weren't right or no. more because Bonanza Week with 10 cracks yeah. at it, right? Yeah, like, yeah. at 10. So, yeah, big year. It's gonna be fun. I think, um, and, and and not to go sideways on this, but I mean, I was talking to Mike Beard about this. I mean, there's a lot of folks looking to hit out and get big money race, lots of Canadians hitting the road and doing well at it. I think this is gonna be a great year. Buskville is gonna I'm have excited. a fantastic year with all the big events. Um, yep. You know, it's, uh, I'm excited for the race season to start. I really, really am. Yes, sir. So. Yes, sir. You and me both. Yep. All right, guys. Well, thanks again for a great show. We appreciate you guys watching, listening, checking out whatever you are doing, you know, means a lot to us. We appreciate Absolutely. it. We're having fun doing this. Let me shut this off if I can. Oh, mouse isn't always working. That's all good. But we will call it a day. See you guys in two weeks. Yep. As I said, we'll have gone racing by then. So we'll have some Canadian results to throw in. Yeah. We'll hopefully, some own, good ones yeah. on our own. But if not, hopefully. hopefully, someone in the audience, that would be awesome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Exactly. Have fun. We'll talk to you guys all in a couple weeks. See you then. See you. Bracket racing isn't just what we do, it's who we are. 
It's how we identify ourselves. What does bracket racing mean to me? It's my life. It's where my people are. My idols, my family, my friends. Bracket racing is life. Bracket life.